Welcome to part two of our interview with Keith Linder about the Bothell Hell House. Thank you for being a gravekeeper and supporting the show, allowing us to do this for you every single week. Sunday night, early Monday morning, uh, if, 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 the, if there ever was an icing on the cake of Katy Perry weekend, it would have to be 1.34 a.m. Monday because me and Tina are asleep and the fire alarm in the house goes off. And we dart out of bed and I look toward the bedroom door, door was closed. I see light illuminating underneath. Um, I jerk open the bedroom door and there's a book on fire, a book. Um, I say book now because I don't know what type of book. Mm -hmm. Um, Flames are dancing all over it. It's on my carpet. It's pitch black in the house. It's 1.34 in the morning. I take my left foot and I use it to close the book to douse out the flames. And that worked. As soon as I did that, I can see it. This is the Bible that was missing or went missing in 2012. As soon as I closed the book, I recognized, oh, that's the green Bible I set on the lampstand almost a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I pick it up, ash smoldering, hallways filled with smoke. And I feel a bulge and there's something in it. I feel a bulge. I'm like, wait a minute. There's something in here. Uh, The spirits are not done with us. So I open up the book. And Tina's standing right next to me, by the way. And there's this wooden cross in the middle. And it's just scorched as well. And I know this cross too because this cross was hanging above our bed before we went to bed that night. This is the cross I bought on Amazon from Jerusalem. Um, and I had it shipped here as a means of protection. And me and Tina said a prayer and we hung it over our headboard in our bedroom. And when you go to bed, you see this cross. There's no way you would know this cross is missing if it wasn't there when you went to bed. And now it's inside the Bible that was gone for a year and a half. And they're both burnt beyond recognition. What what goes through your mind at this moment when something this dramatic happens? Devil. Yeah. Devil. I mean, just straight up devil or straight up demon devil. And I'm a, I'm a spiritual religious guy. I grew up in the church and I, and I, you know, hung around Sunday school or whatever. And I, I and I know in today's society, especially in the paranormal, you know, everybody likes to scream demon or devil early, you know. Sure. But, but I think now in conjunction with some of the other things. Um, yeah, I mean, when I say demon or devil, I, 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 I just mean these are just, this is malevolent, yeah. okay? This is out of the ballpark, beyond the pale, malevolent. You get, we have fire now. Fire has now been introduced <laughs> into the haunting of Keith and Tina. And um, I was, I mean, you should have seen the look on me and Tina's face that night and that morning. Because that now I'm going to work and people were like, hey, how was your weekend, Keith? And I'm like, <laughs> I got a look on my face like, save me because I'm about to walk into moving traffic. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's the expression I'm now walking in to work with. And everybody who knows me sort of knows what's happening in our home, but you don't know until you actually see it. So I called the paranormal team who came in the night before and the lady literally dropped the phone. She said, I've been doing this 34 years. I've never dealt with nothing like that. And she was straight up honest. She was like, uh, that's past my skill to I, 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 I don't, I don't know, dude. I mean, we blessed the house. We were there 11 hours. We did this and that. Um, you got fire mm-hmm. now. And, um, yeah, that, that was that was a bad, that, and that was Katy Perry weekend. That was the conclusion. Um, and of course, it got worse after that. But yeah, that was Katy Perry weekend. I, I certainly want to hear what happens as it gets worse. But at this point, I have to ask you, and this is probably one of the more common questions you get. <laughs> yeah. uh, how did you have the patience to stay in the house when things are getting this bad? Yeah, um, that's a very multidimensional well, the answer is multi-dimensional because different phases, me and Tina would be like, you know, cut and run. Do we cut and run? 
do you cut your losses now? No house is worth this. No peace of mind is worth this. At the same time, me personally, more than Tina, um, I just like to pro- I'm a problem solver. Uh, I spent my 30 odd years in IT and, and, and I and I and I, I mitigate and solve problems. As bad as everything was happening around us, it seemed like a, a problem worth solving. I was thinking, I looked at Tina, I'm like, we can't I mean if we leave if we leave this house now, who are we leaving it to? Mm-hmm. Somebody else is gonna come in here and these spirits are gonna still be here raising hell and they may go dormant, but the you know, cutting and running or leaving just seemed too cliche. I know it's easier said than done, but it just seemed too knee jerk for me. And at the same time, this was my first house. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, you know, this is my house. Um, I got a huge job promotion, which just helped me acquire it. And um, I was just like, no, these spirits are not going to beat me in my own house. Um, of course, I was very naive. Um, I still had not known, and I still don't know even to this day, everything that we were facing. Um, But it was a lot of naivete, but I was just firm in my belief because the churches that we were working with were advising us, we can win this fight. It's it's winnable. It's not going to be easy. And they were honest in their assessment of, whoa, this is not going to be easy, dude. This is, but it's winnable. But you, you and Tina are in a unique situation to where y'all can come out to victor and you know to god be the glory but um for me it was just more trying to get to the root cause because now i've now turned part-time investigator myself um i've now made contact with a previous tenant who lived in the house five years before us who told us because i contacted her yeah that the house was a living hell she said oh that house Oh, yeah, it almost killed us. I mean, this is what she's telling me. And I immediately knew what she was talking about because she's like, oh, that house, it felt like it was alive. It was the beginning of the end in that house. It destroyed our marriage, destroyed my son. Um, He complained of seeing shadows. And I knew because I saw them, too. Um, Her and her husband got divorced in that house. Uh, They saw objects move, kitchen cabinets open, loud bangs, footsteps. Uh, door slams on him and she's telling me all this and this is five years before we even arrived that they experienced it but they just left she said well we left and yeah we, we didn't tell anybody we, you know who are you gonna tell who's gonna believe you so that sort of reinforces my idea well if we leave number one there's, there's a chance this thing can follow us but i mean it can haunt the other people just as equal mm-hmm. and um no, it, needs to, it, it stops now. That's, that, that was one of my ideas of it stops now. The, the hell or whatever's here, it, it ends with us. But trust me, that's not an easy diagnosis because me and Tina, this is 2014, we had no idea what was about to happen. I mean, it, it's, yeah, the gloves were coming off big time by the uh, summer of 2014. So you stay in the house after that incident. How did things continue to progress to get even worse? Well, we had a, a second fire. Uh, the poster fire was a few, I think a week, if not maybe more after the Bible caught fire. Tina had just left for work. Um, I'm in the shower and the fire alarms goes off again. And in my house, when fire alarms goes off, you know, you're DEFCON 1. Because I rush out. And when I get to the landing, I kid you not, I felt a force run past me and a lot of thundering went down the footsteps, but nobody's there. And the front door opened wide and shut again. This is the fire alarm going off. Um, Something in my brain told me to run to the front door. I'm, I'm thinking intruder in the house. Even though I didn't see anybody, that obviously had to be an intruder, okay? I get to the front door. It doesn't even open. I mean, it's like a force is holding that door cement shut, like it's been, you know, shut. And I knew right then and there, Keith, you're under attack. Um, I still got a fire to contend with that I have not researched. So I dart back upstairs and true enough, smoke is coming out of my office. And I walk in there and my poster is on fire. 
flames are dancing all on it and I throw my bath towel on the fire to put the poster out or the fire out and run back downstairs and the front door still won't open uh, the fire alarms are still wailing and I called 911 I mean, I called 911 to get the fire department because I thought there was a fire that they started that either I couldn't get to or I don't know where it's at because the alarms were just going nonstop. And then I called Tina to make a U-turn. Tina had not even reached the highway yet. And I said, come back to the house. All this happened within about three minutes. I said, the house is under attack. The house is under attack. Um, Of course, nobody could find root cause for the poster catching fire. Um, and me and Tina being so shell shocked, me especially, sat down or we drove to the local parish office in Bothell and sat in there and waited for about five or six hours before the priest would see us uh, because we were not leaving that church until the local priest would see us because up until that time they had just been brushing us off. Uh, and he finally saw us that day when we told about the fire. Uh, but yeah, other activity thereafter, you're talking about um, coming home from work and it looks like Hurricane Sandy has just left your house because now we're coming home, me and Tina, and everything's turned upside down. Furniture, coffee table, lamps, um, your kitchen cabinet, all, all the doors are open. Everything inside has been rearranged. It's just total mayhem in every room in the house pretty much. Uh, And that happened every day. And then when you're home, after you you put everything back together, you're back to the phantom footsteps, the loud banging, the slamming of the doors, occasional plant being thrown. Um, So I went out and bought more cameras to try to catch some of that phenomena in real time. And soon enough, here come the wall markings. I mean, the wall writings, I should say. Of now you come home, your house looks like it just had Hurricane Sandy run through, but now it looks like it also had somebody who just had a gross imagination with a, a bucket of paint. Because now in my room, in my room only, are these inexplicable wall writings. We're talking upside down crosses, six six six. Uh, and then later, the upside down man stick figure, which we later learned, I later learned, is a Native American symbol, which means uh, a man has died or a man is about to die. When you sat down with the priest there, uh, after the, you're waiting five hours for t- to see him, and, and you, you unload, I'm assuming you unloaded and, and started to share what happened. What's the reaction? What do you get? Believe it or not, his reaction was very receptive. We were referred to this priest months ago by the local parish in Seattle. They said, this parish, you're lucky to be in Boston because this priest at this parish, he deals with the supernatural for the regional churches, for, for the Catholic churches. So um, that's what we were so trying to get a hold of him. Uh, everybody was pushing us towards him. So when we finally told him our story, um, it was like singing to the choir. Our only problem with him was he was not reliable and not as organized as we have liked to be because um, up until the day we finally saw him, him and his secretary, his secretary mainly, were telling us he'll call you, he'll call you, he'll call you, and he never did. So we're finally, we're in his office, we see on his desk a stack of notes saying, call Tina, call Keith, call Tina, call Tina. I kid you not. And he even admitted to that and apologized to that. said, hey, I'm kind of disorganized. I'm kind of disheveled here. But um, yeah, so he listened to our story and then told us some of some other accounts in and around the Seattle area that he has been doing in the past. So he said, what we told him was not unusual. And we thought, okay, we got a familiar ear. We've come to the right place. Um, he knows what to do. And, and, he, and he gave us pointers and said he would work with us and gave us a sheet of what to do and what not to do. Um, so yeah, we, we left his office feeling like mission accomplished. Uh, but keep in mind... As we're doing our proactive 
things, so are the spirits. And they're not going to go easy, easily. And they made it known the minute he left, because he came and blessed the house several times. He came and held communion, uh, held mass. And the activity would die down for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then would just come back. And he predicted that. He said, that's going to happen. He said, that's that's written in the that's written in here that we know that's going to happen. But we got to be steadfast, especially you and Tina. Y'all don't want to live here, and we have to be we have to be unison. You know, we can't have one kink in the armor because if we hesitate or blink just a little, they're going to tether to the house some more. So um, yeah, he he gave good advice. I just don't think he was. Uh, in my book, I talk about it a lot. I don't I don't think he was just um, available as much. Mm-hmm. Um, it seemed to be, and we later found out why. I mean, we later found out that he wasn't, and it was almost like a side project because Tina contacted the bishop, his bishop, a few months later, like six months later, because we couldn't find the guy anymore, and the bishop never heard of us. He's like, who are you guys? And that was very discerning uh, for us because we were like, you mean your priest doesn't hasn't told you that he's been working with for the last six months? And he was like, no. So, yeah. yeah. Going back to the house and you're now getting those writings on the wall and, and everything else amped up. What goes on from there? Uh, well, uh, more angst, more anxiety, because now significant damage. Uh, we now have fire on the wall. We now have writings. Um, of course, you got to paint over that stuff. Um priests and other churches came to bless it and then you paint over it um, then the spirits write over it again you know it's almost like a day later so now you're you're spinning your wheels it sort of seems like we're getting nowhere fast with this uh, and the second bible caught fire a few uh, days after the first one uh, the third bible caught fire a few days after the second one um and then now, interesting enough, the spirits are manipulating Tina and me. Um, if Tina or myself forget to sage or lead in prayer for tonight, um, the other person gets upset. The other person feels like the other person is not pulling their weight. So you start getting angst, sleep deprived, tired. And that's to say, that's the the thing I talked about earlier about we don't know what we're in for or we're sort of naive because there's a lot of things happening around me and Tina that are not physical but are still equally if not more deadly uh, because the mood is changing in the house and our mood how we look at each other me and Tina is now changing Um, I'm grouchy she's grouchy uh, I'm at work and I call, hey, did you catch up with the priest today? Oh, no, I forgot. I got busy and I get frustrated. So you bring that energy home and the spirits leap on that. You know, they leap on that. And, um, yeah, finally, I mean, it got so bad. I mean, it did finally catch the attention of Ghost Adventures uh, through the local media because the Bibles and the loud bangers and the wall writings got kept, caught the attention of local media. The local media or caught the attention of ghost adventures and um yeah so about november of 2014 um zach and crew did come to the house um and investigate uh they did about five hours worth of investigation Uh, i don't know if you're familiar with that episode but uh they left empty-handed um and then them leaving empty-handed sort of painted me and Tina in a negative light with a portion of the paranormal field because one of the things me and Tina kept running to into when we were making our claims known in public was there's no way a house could be that active. I mean, you talk to paranormal researchers who've been doing this for years and some of them, not all of them, would say you would live your entire life to just have one phenomena what you're reporting and you're talking about 50 or 80 no i mean a house would implode i mean that's just not you got wall writings you got bibles catching fire posters catching fire so it was even hard for some to believe in the paranormal community unless they were there to witness it uh themselves and if they didn't they sort of thought ah you guys are a little bit over exaggerating that can't happen that's not real your house is brand new your house is brand new hasn't even been lived in long enough to be haunted 
limited. And those were roadblocks that we were running into. And that was frustrating. That was frustrating for us because, you know, I know just by my profession, there's a first time for everything. And finally, um, toward the end of 2014, um, yeah, Ghost of just came and left. And now we're now in 2015. And the activity is now narrowed down to not just me and Tina. Now the activity is just uh, they're attacking me now. They're attacking me with Tina being a bystander. You know, Tina leaves for work. All the lights in the house go off. If I stay in the bed when Tina goes to work, I'm in trouble because all the lights are going to go off and the object's going to be thrown. They used to be thrown over the bed. Now they're thrown in the bed with me. Uh, bed shakes, bed vibrations. Uh, the 666 and the upside down man figure and the upside down crosses have are now gone. What's now replaced that is the words Die KL, my initials. Mm -hmm. I come home, oh, Die KL written everywhere on my wall on the lawn and my car is scratched on headboards everywhere i got more car keys missing wallet missing valuables missing um all that stuff is really homing in now it's driving tina crazy because there's nothing she can do except she's seeing all this phenomena happen around me she's worried she's fearful she's frantic she's calling people they're not calling her back and yeah, it just really, I mean, you talk, we're, we're both averaging about four, maybe five hours sleep at that stage. How, how does this continue? Did you, do you get to a point where, where any of this is resolved? Uh, well, it doesn't have a, a happy ending, <laughs> uh, Tony. Um, and that's not the Hollywood, yeah, the Hollywood angles. Yeah. The, the cavalry comes in and, uh, saves the day, but no, this, this ordeal, the four year ordeal, um, me and Tina broke up. I mean, Tina, the last straw for Tina was her ill portrayal on the episode Demons in Seattle. Uh, we broke up five days after that episode aired. Um, they really, as a means of not getting any evidence, portrayed her on the episode as possi possibly being the agent behind it all. And the uh, blogosphere, social blogosphere, just ate that up and really... Uh, denigrated her and um yeah so she moved out uh we broke up five days after that episode that was about february 25th 28th is when the episode aired um me i still had a year and a half left on the lease believe you not i stayed in the home and i doubled down now it's just me in this crazy house and a portion of the paranormal community believing that it's all hoaxed or made up so i turned inward I started going to the Seattle local library downtown and reading books about poltergeist because that was thrown at me by some people as, oh, you got a poltergeist, dude. I never, I, I didn't know what that was. And the more I read about poltergeist, because what I read was, oh, this is exactly what's happening in our house. This, oh, yeah, this is, this is us. Mm -hmm. And one of the names that popped up in my research was the word parapsychology. And attached to that was the name of Steve Mara. And I'm like, Steve Mara, who's this guy? Um, but I researched Steve Mara and I saw a couple of his lectures. He's in the UK. He's done lectures about poltergeist activity. Uh, he belongs to an organization that researches, investigates these things out. And I sent him a whole bunch of emails and photographs and videos. And it took about two months to respond to me. But when he did, he found the, uh, the information compelling. So they put me through a whole process of interviews, him and his organization, and uh, he, he contacted his friend, Don Phillips, and they agreed to come to the house. Um, uh, let's see, January of 2016 is when they came. Our communications started October that previous year. So they come, and lo and behold, they did something that no team has ever done before except Nikki and Carissa, who are in the United States, was they lived in the house. And by living, I mean they stayed a week the first time around, and uh, well, five days the first time around, and then seven days the second time around. They made two trips, January and April of 2016, and got a truckload of evidence as well as an admittance of this is something we've never seen before. Um, 
this is Steve Maris saying this, and he's got 34 years of experience, but the, the crux of the story was basically the case, or the house, I should say, started to get its turnaround once more qualified teams started coming in, because once you got qualified teams coming in, they have two facets to their investigative. One of them, they're trying to uncover evidence, and then they're trying to mitigate it at the same time, uh, mitigate the activity. And they told me these things will make es- will escalate the activity, like number one, your cameras, the infrared stuff. That's got to go. That's get it out of here. Um, the spirits will eat that up. And there was data to support that. Uh, based on my spreadsheet that I kept, yeah, the activity did spike the minute I brought cameras in. And it, it was just really... Uh, once they verified the house as what they call an intelligent haunting uh, slash poltergeist haunting with a lot of other different variables at it um, yeah that to me for me that was the time to go was um, we found out you know what's causing well not what's causing it but that something is here it's been validated it's been substantiated um the homeowner who gave approval for all the teams coming in has now got folder after folder after folder of all the activity taking place. Whoever comes in after this house, after me, they're going to know this house was haunted. There's no way you can't. And um, you have a decision to make whether you want to live in a house like that because Steve Merritt and others have said the potentiality is always going to be there. Mm-hmm. If the house can go dormant, it did go dormant for other few tenants we know that by the people we talked to and the people that we didn't talk to Um, there's five years between me and the the family that did have activity so we know it can go dormant it's just a it's just a combination of synergy and people that may make a house behave the way ours did no other house on the block did not even close so we have to think it's the synergy of what transpired here before and what walks through the door to live here. Um, Obviously, some people may have activity and not even notice it. Uh, What made me notice it was some of the phenomena that happened and then getting cameras to sort of capture it happening again. But um, yeah, moving out, uh, I moved out May, almost, yeah, four years to the day, almost May 8th of 2016 is when I moved out. And I mean, there's a lot of data on the house, but yeah, it wasn't a Hollywood ending. It did cost me my relationship, um, and it was it was hard. I mean, sure. I tell people, this is not something you want to wish on anybody. Or people always say, "Oh, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have lived there. I just want to spend a night there." You know, it's, like it's not an Airbnb. <laughs> it's not it's, it's not your bed and bath. You're not gonna have you know ex Benedict in the morning and have a haunted house. This is this is real, and it was real. We know for a fact that two families got totally messed up. The previous family and, and my potential family, because Auntie and Tina broke up, and it's not. Yeah, there's no happy ending here, and there's multiple energies there, multiple spirits, and then most of them are not friendly. Not based on what I've seen with my own eyes. Something about that house attracted them there from the Jump Street, and they're not to be underestimated or mess with was there any evidence that you found or, or any any explanation i guess i should say as to why this thing was there or these things were there at this fairly new home yeah no, i mean the evidence we found it was so um a lot of it was compelling like going back to the wall writings a lot of the wall writings were done in native american Language in Bothell, Washington, as well as the state of Washington, there's a lot of Native American history here. So we thought it would have to do with the land. Mm -hmm. And we did find interesting things about the house, meaning there once was a cabin where that house used to be back in the mid 1900s. A a cabin was built there in 1945, where our house currently now sits. And um, it faced the creek. There's a creek that runs behind the house. some of the EVPs that Dawn and Steve captured gave rise because the questions was asked, is there any Native Americans here? And the spirits would say yes, or they would say, yes, I mean, there's burial grounds here. And so those were captured on EVP. And also just some of the land records that showed that Bothell back in the 1800s, Boston was I mean, Bothell was a logging community, and there was a lot of wars that broke out between the settlers and the Native Americans here 
over the mass chopping down of trees. And there was a lot of sabotage that the Native Americans did to the settlers to prevent that. And that happened in and around the area that we now live in. But once again, no other house is experiencing it. But the wall writings, the substance, one of the substances we were able to analyze, I had it analyzed to see what it was made out of. And the substance was made out of bone black. And most people have never heard of bone black. I never heard of it. And it was interesting how we found out about it is because the makeup of this paint material, or what we thought was paint, is organic. It's 100% organic. And it's a lot of phosphate in it, a lot of calcium in it. And I just shopped the ingredients of that paint around to art galleries to a five or four or five of them finally said, that's bone black. That's a rare painting substance. And I'm like, well, what is bone black? What is it? I said, oh, that's just incinerated cow bone or really buffalo bone. It's when you take the buffalo, because back in the early 1800s, there was a mass uh, killing of buffalo throughout the North America to where the countryside was littered with buffalo bones. So they made it into a commodity by burning it down and using it as paint. And bone black is an ancient form of pictography and calligraphy. Native Americans use it through multicultures throughout the world. And so that was interesting. While the spirits would choose bone black as one of the means for its painting on the wall, because you can't buy bone black in your local paint store. You can't buy it in any store. There's only one store in the entire world that sells it. And they sell it in small quantities. So that was interesting. And then Dawn got an EVP under the house that I lived in that said Long House. Well, Long House is a Native American terminology and there are a lot of long houses, long cabins uh, in and around Bothell that the Native Americans use for trading posts. The term is a long house. People can Google it. You can see what that looks like. So those things, um, going back to the previous tenant who lived in the house five years before us, um, there was a lot of dark things about uh, the uh, the spouse, the wife, uh, that I list in my uh, book that she was going through. Um, a lot of dark times for her and her family. Um, I just think somehow um, a portal, and, and, and for lack of a better word, a portal, something, something, a beacon shined on that house in a negative way to just attract negative spirits because we have a lot of EVPs and a lot of the EVPs the spirits say on there we, we're we here, we like being here and we just go from house to house I mean they're saying that, these are the EVPs we've captured and they're on my YouTube channel for anybody who wants to read and listen to these EVPs uh, be careful but you, you will hear the spirits actually saying these things of yeah, we traverse from house to house and basically they sum it up as we just look for vulnerabilities and for some odd reason this house was i mean easy pickings for them that's going to wrap up our interview with keith linder i have so many more questions hopefully we can have him on the show another time thank you keith for joining us you can find the link to keith's book and his website on our website thegravetalks.com until next time for the grave talks i'm tony bruski thanks for listening